By the end of this video, you will know the main characteristics, purposes and suitability of devices and understand their principle of operations. So in the digital age in which we live, we're literally surrounded by thousands of different input and output devices, and they're all designed with a specific purpose in mind. On the screen is a very brief selection of some of the more common input and output devices that you might be familiar with. Now, for the purpose of your exam, they are specifically stated in the specification for input and output devices, which you have to know the characteristics, purposes, suitability, and also the operation of. And that's a barcode reader, digital camera, laser printer, and RFID tags. So we're going to go through each of those now. So the first is the barcode reader. Now, the Humble Barcode has been around for a long time, and as you know, it's used to uniquely identify millions and millions of products. They're often used for tracking delivery of items, they're used on tickets, items in shops, luggage tags, medical records, etc, etc. The first original type of barcode that came out all the way back in the 1970s was the 1D Linear Barcode. It holds a limited amount of information, but we still see it in use today, most commonly in supermarkets and shops. The more modern version is a 2D barcode, which we know as a QR, or quick response code. This is able to encode more complex information, and it's often used in mobile phone apps to take users off to a website for further information. Now, there's a number of different styles of barcode readers, and they all essentially do the same thing, which is extract information that's been encoded into a barcode. There's four main types. The first one is pen style readers. Now they're called this because they physically look like a pen and you drag the pen slowly and evenly and consistently across the barcode from left to right. There's a light source and a photodiode placed in the tip of the pen and the diode measures the intensity of light reflected back as it passes over the black and white stripes. The dark patches absorb light and the white ones reflect it. And this waveform can then easily be translated into a digital format. You know, for example, this digital signal here, we could translate the dark patches, say, as zeros, and the light patches as ones. We could use this to look up an ASCII value, which could be a code in a table that relates to a product at a simple level. The next one is laser scanners. Now, these are the type that you're typically be familiar with at the checkout of a supermarket. They work in basically the same way as the pen scanner. The difference here is first, a laser is used as a light source, and secondly, the laser is reflected off a moving mirror. And this last bit's important because it results in the fact that the barcode can be read from many different positions and angles, meaning scanning can be quick and fast. Next we have CCD readers, or charged coupled devices. This is an array of tiny light sensors lined up in a row. These are all placed in the head of a reader, and each sensor measures the intensity of the light directly in front of it. Every sensor is so small that a voltage pattern can be worked out, which is identical to the pattern of the barcode. And finally, we have camera-based readers. And this is the sort of reader you'll be familiar with from a smartphone when you use them to scan QR codes. It uses your camera and image processing software and then it decodes the information in the 1D or 2D barcode. The second device you need to be aware about is a digital camera. Now, digital cameras use either CCDs, as described already, charged coupled device sensors, or CMOS, complementary metal oxide semiconductor sensors. Now, the CCD produces very high quality images. However, it's only really useful in high-end cameras because it's quite bulky and it uses up to 100 times more power than CMOS. CMOS therefore produces lower quality images if we use that sensor, but much less power consumption. So how effectively do we take an image and turn it into a digital format with a digital camera? Well, the sensor itself comprises of millions of tiny light sensors arranged into a grid. When you take a photo, the shutter on the camera opens and light enters it. An image is projected onto the sensors at the back of the lens and each tiny sensor measures the brightness of each pixel. 
it turns this into electrical signals and stores it as binary. Now what's important to note here is the image which is being stored is a grayscale representation of the picture that was being taken. Now obviously today we're very used to taking full colour pictures. So to make colour images, the sensor is often placed behind coloured filters. Now there's a number of methods of doing this, we'll just quickly go over two. One method splits the incoming light to the camera into three paths and then passes each through a separate red, blue and green filter. Each is picked up by its own set of sensors and the digital image is then combined and recreated. Now this creates much higher quality images but the camera tends to be more bulky so we tend to reserve this for high-end photography. Another method places a mosaic of red, blue and green filters. Um, this separates out the different colours. The software then has to make digital approximations in binary for each individual pixel based on the values of neighbouring pixels. Now this method allows for very compact, compact digital cameras. Now you'd think this method probably wouldn't be as effective, and you'd be right, it doesn't produce as high quality images, but it can produce incredibly accurate recreations. You'll notice there's twice as many green squares in this mosaic as there are blue and red, and that's deliberate, and that's because to create a realistic photo which matches what we see of our naked eye, we need twice as many green filters than blue and red. Now let's look at a laser printer. Now this works in a very similar way to photocopiers and it produces high quality printing at speeds. We have powdered ink which is loaded into the printer and stored in cartridges or hoppers. Print software generates a bitmap of what is needed. And then the print drum is negatively charged. We then shine a laser off a mirror and create a reverse image on the drum. Now this laser light causes the areas of the drum that it hits to lose their negative charge. As it rotates past the hopper, the charged particles in the toner attach to the areas of the page which haven't been lasered. This is then instantly placed through a heated fuser that bonds the, um, the toner to the page using a combination of heat and pressure. A couple of notes, um, the maximum quality you'll get with a laser printer is around 1200 dpi, so it's not photorealistic. So for photorealistic we really have to then move to inkjet printers. Now colour laser printers use four sets of toner hoppers and that's cyan, magenta, yellow and black and this entire process would have to be repeated four times before the colour image came out. Finally, let's look at um, RFID tags. Now, just like barcodes, RFID tags store information. And they're being used like barcodes to track products and even things like animals and pets. The difference here is unlike a barcode, they can be read without line of sight and up to 300 metres away. And they can pass stored information from the tag to the receiver and vice versa. They consist essentially of a tiny microchip, this one here is less than a millimetre and it's at the centre of this image, and then a much larger antenna for communication that's usually wrapped around it. We often embed these RFID, cap um, these RFID chips in capsules as you can see here, and they allow for easy injection. Uh, many people use these for identification of pets. There are two main types of tags. There's active tags, which are much larger because they contain an onboard battery for power and they actively and constantly transmit a signal. Now they're used to track items at a much greater distance. For example, uh, cars driving by an automated motorway toll booth. The much more common and cheaper versions are the passive tags. They're much smaller and they have no onboard battery. They rely on radio waves from the reader to provide enough electromagnetic power to energise the antenna coil. The transponder inside the RFID tag can then send its data and this is typically used for things like uh, CD labels and smart cards.